Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Greg Oldring. He's the co-founder and CEO of Zept. Greg, welcome back to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, of course. Well, I thought it's interesting because you were one of the my kind of original guests, I think in the first 10 or so. That's amazing. And, and so we worked together back then a number of years yeah. ago. I'm back. We're working together on Zept. But maybe before we get into that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Oh, I grew up, well, I was born in, in Hamilton in Ontario. Very cool. Uh, I lived there until I was five and then moved yeah, for my family back home, which is to Alberta and Canada, to Edmonton. Uh, and I've lived in Edmonton ever since. So very another cool. 40-ish years <laughs> in cool, Edmonton. Cool. Yeah. So you've had a really interesting background, but let's cover what, what you took in university and why, and then let's get into the startup stuff pretty quick, because sure. you've done a ton of them. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've got a few to <laughs> rattle off, I suppose. Yeah, uh, school, so I you, you took high school here in Edmonton, and it just was in the tracks, went to the local university here, which thankfully happens to be a great university, uh, University of Alberta, um, and I, when I was in high school, I wanted to be a doctor, so okay. I took science, I did Very two cool. years of science, uh, I realized pretty quickly I had to work to get the <laughs> grades and I did not have the work skills at the time to actually get the grades I would need to be, get into to medicine. So, But you uh, married a doctor. So I married close, a doctor. So I was like, you know, the <laughs> better, the better thing to do, actually. <laughs> All the That's benefits amazing. without the work. Because uh, it gets just worse and worse. She's worked so hard in that career. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so so I, I wasn't going to be a doctor. That didn't work out. So I uh, took a year of arts, and I, I took some economics, which I really enjoyed. Sure. Um, and I actually applied for a fine arts. I don't know if you knew this. I, I applied for fine arts. I don't know if I did remember. And applied for business okay. after a year of arts, because I thought, okay, an arts degree. I don't know what that's going <laughs> to land me on. <laughs> sure. I like the economics. Uh, but I ended up, um, not being accepted to fine arts. Thankfully, that probably okay. would not have worked out well for me, but then I, I went into business sure. and eventually finished a bachelor of commerce degree, an undergrad degree, but that stretched out over like seven years. I think it was wow. because that's the, the segue is in, uh, in the middle of, of my, like between my third year, what they class is my third year and my fourth year. Uh, I started uh, or helped my friends start a business because there were it was a recession here in Alberta. There were no jobs to be had. Sure. And so um, I had enough money from a, an inheritance from my grandma to be able to go to school the next year. Okay. Um, which isn't a lot of money. This is Canada, so the, <laughs> going to school was not expensive, especially back then. No. Well, and the cost <laughs> but, of living here was cheap. Yeah, it was right? super back cheap. Like day. everything was yeah. really cheap. But uh, but I had enough money. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't going to go have to take loans or anything like that to go to school. And, uh, and, but I would have only made six bucks an hour digging ditches or something like that sure. if, if I could find a job digging ditches. But my friend had started this thing, which was, uh, a parts locator service for heavy truck parts. Okay. Uh, and it was all fax based and it actually has just celebrated its 25th anniversary. Wow. Congrats. Yeah. That's huge. Actually. That is huge. That's right. Very cool. So, so my buddy Scott Tates, uh, it's called truck parts solutions now, but okay. at that point we were parts link. We called it at first and I did 3000 cold calls wow. to, <laughs> to truck parts salvage <laughs> yards. So I talked to all these guys named Bubba <laughs> that summer. There's so Very many cool. Bubba's. Um, and actually, I, I, you know, some of the lines, some of the funniest lines, like, um, you know, I'm, I, I'd hear these over and over, like, I'm up to my ass in alligators, <laughs> or, or, or I'm busier than a one arm paper hanger. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you can say this on your show, you yeah, can edit fine. it out, but the, my funniest one was, I'm going through fax paper like shit through a goose. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I've never heard any of them yeah, before. Those are all so funny. So I love these. The, the The customer base was great, but these are like basically salvage yards. Sure. Uh, so you can imagine um, 
one of my first lessons in business was make sure you get paid. Sure. <laughs> so it was great. Like it was a good lesson to learn. Uh, it was a subscription model business. So we'd, we'd, we'd get people to, you know, we have a sort of free trial. We'd send these faxes to people of what they were looking to buy and sell. So it was sure. a marketplace business. Right, cool. And, uh, and then, um, then they would, you know, subscribe. It was like, a, I can't remember what it was like $79 a month okay. or something like that. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but it grew really fast over the summer. So I did all these cold calls and it was working out and the, the faxes that we would send kept getting longer and longer and longer. Okay. And so as you added more customers, the fax got longer. This is back when long distance was actually super expensive. Sure. So we were, we were spending 25 cents a minute. Wow. On the overnight rates to send faxes. And so, uh, as we approached, uh, I, I did the math and I said, well, you know what? Scott, when we hit 220 customers, we're going to start losing money <laughs> if wow. we add more customers. Interesting. So we uh, we started figuring out ways to cut down this this like long distance cost. Sure. And it's this is the summer of '94. Okay, very, and, very early on. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty. Yeah. Early. And summer '94, uh, the the solution for that was. Uh, the information superhighway, which yep. was pitched at that time as free long distance. Interesting. Right? That's sure. where, because yeah. it was like sort of later on when people were trying to explain Twitter to the public, like you remember news outlets and things yeah. just making fun of what is Twitter and yep. they, people just didn't get what it was. It was completely the same thing back then. Like people had no idea. So then anyways, they, we, we did that. Uh, we ended up, I had another friend that had the first internet service provider in Alberta here. Okay. Uh, Randy Thompson's his name. And he, he had been bugging me to see this. So I went to his office in October 94. I still remember sure. that. And he showed me the web in October 94. And it completely blew my mind. I'm like, sure. this is not free long distance. This is going to change everything. Sure. And so I kind of set my mind spinning about like, what is next for, you know, what is this going to open up for opportunities? And although the, of course, you know, truck part solution is all web today. I think they sent their last fax about two years ago, but, uh, it's crazy that it took that long. It is actually <laughs> funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that is pretty funny, but, uh, I figured that truck part salvage yards wouldn't be quick to adopt this, this sure. technology, yeah, but, uh, but we saw, saw the opportunity, Scott and I both in like construction equipment, sure. whole equipment and, and trucks because they get expensive, sold over long distances. It's a good fit for, for this. So that's when GSNet was born. So, um, so now I'm, I'm taking school part-time at this point. Sure. And our buddy, Mike, who we'd grown up with as well, who was like the really smart guy always, <laughs> uh, he have, was, was taking his computing science degree. I okay. was taking business. I did the business plan for GSNet as a project. And okay. Mike actually did the the database side of it for a class in school. That's amazing. And uh, and all the CGI scripts and so on that we learned. So we ended up like figuring out how to make this thing. Because back then it was $250 an hour to get someone to do HTML. Right. Which yeah, was yeah. comical. Because when we... <laughs> I, I ended up getting this book from that came with the... with O'Reilly and Associates website server software yes. uh, that was like a little manual for, for the software. <laughs> it had a chapter in the book of how to write HTML, sure. which I read in you know, probably 20 minutes or something like that. And I realized, oh, this is super easy. I could do this. Sure. Um, and then after that, it was all view source. But anyways, that, that business did, did well as well. Uh, Scott and I ended up splitting the two companies between us. Unfortunately, it was acrimoniously at the time. Like we were, it was that was a hard breakup at the time. Happens, yeah. Yeah, but you know, since then we're like patched things up. No, well, that's good. Twenty though. years ago, yeah, <laughs> so, no, so good. we're no, good friends good again though, today. Most people yeah. don't, right? Yeah, and I really credit Scott actually for that too. Like he was he he uh, he put in the work to actually restore that relationship. Uh, cool. I, I was probably too much of a jerk. But <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, uh, kudos to Scott for that. Sure. I'm really glad for that. Uh, friendship to be restored and, and lasting but um yeah so that the next business was was well you GSNet. sold you, man, you sold gsnet so walk yeah. us through actually building that to selling that because it's quite fascinating you have some funny like yeah there's some crazy dot stories com bubble yeah so type <laughs> stories so gsnet I, I was toiling away in my parents basement at this point um and 
I for a while Mike had gone to to Montreal. Okay, followed his 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 wife. She did her master's degree, so I he wasn't going to be able to do the, the the coding for this. Okay, so we had to find other people to do it for a while, which was really interesting, and we had some. <laughs> some ups and downs in that sure. and fortunately another friend of mine was a good coder uh and so he did uh you know he was doing sort of the back end stuff and i was doing the front end stuff uh but in before i found that other friend he, he I, I still remember the line of uh you know he sort of leaned back in his chair one day and he's like greg i i just i gotta ask you like there's some of this code that is so elegantly written and so so good, and there's others that just is terrible. <laughs> Did two people write this? <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike did the elegant, great stuff, and uh, others did the sure. the not so great stuff. Um, but then, he's, uh, thankfully, Mike came back, and so uh, so Mike and I worked together in my parents' basement for a while. When I first started that business, one of the crazy things that I did was actually call all of the competitors, like the existing players in the space. Okay. I literally just called them. So okay. hi, I'm Greg. I've got this. Uh, you know, business or we're on the information super highway, sure. kind of in the same space. I just thought I'd, you know, reach out and say hello and get to know you. Okay. So I did that with uh, about five different companies at the time that were all doing classified advertising and construction equipment, heavy truck space. Okay. And, um, you know, interestingly, over the next year, those relationships started to form a little bit because I'd see these people at conferences and stuff sure. like that or you know, whatever later on. Um, the first so this is that was summer of 95 then by uh january 96 after one of the customers had their first sale which was, was like that story spread sure. like wildfire through the industry like <laughs> you know peter party sold a a, a grader or i ended up being three motor graders to a guy in sweden th over the information superhighway that's so amazing. it was a big deal and er, that that ended up being like i think about four hundred thousand wow. dollars dead stock for them Sure. Right. That they ended up selling to somebody in Sweden. So it was like a a win win for everybody, and uh, and the the story spread like wildfire. And so Peter Party uh, called me and said, "Greg, there's a conference. This like, which I had no idea what he was really talking about at the time. Okay. Like, there's an association of a, of construction equipment dealers. We have a conference in San Diego in January. You need to come." Okay. And I said, okay, sure, I'll do that. I've never been to a conference before. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I had a, a booth at a conference. I got a 10 by 10 booth at this conference. Sure. And, um, and, and then I've actually never since seen a busier trade show booth. It was unbelievable. Really? Yeah, I, of course, I had no idea that that this wasn't normal but like all the other all these competitors that had called over earlier sure. they came around my booth and like oh hey kid you know <laughs> good luck <laughs> but there's kind of just checking me out all the speakers at the conference were just hammering on these these construction equipment dealers to say sure. if you're not on the internet in five years you're going to be out of business that was the line sure. that they kept and they saying probably thought he was crazy and so well so all these these people would come and i had my dad there to help me because nice. i had yeah, I, I couldn't handle it all myself, and I had no idea what I was doing. He's, he's his background sales, and my dad would stand in the aisle with okay. the owners of the business, and their sons would come and talk to me, and the sons crazy, would be though. older than me, actually, <laughs> <laughs> which was funny. <laughs> but we would be six deep in a ten by ten booth. That's cool though. for like for the whole time I was there. So that was pretty wild. Sure. And then um, so that sort of traction happened. Then then uh, over the next few months. The, a consortium of those competitors in the space, like the old the print businesses, sure. actually came together to try and buy that business. Okay. To buy GSNet. Okay. And they made an offer the month that I finally broke even. Wow. And so it finally stopped costing me money to be in business. And I was like, you know what? It's kind of too late. Like this offer isn't good enough. It was basically just to have it pay my debts and and I'd have a salary. Sure. And, uh, and I thought, no, you know, I can see this thing's gonna work. So. I'll keep going. Okay. And by the way, VC and all of that, I didn't even know existed. Like I had no sure no concept of. So it wasn't really an option. You had to figure out how to make money as quick as possible. Yeah. Because you were draining money. Yeah. Right? yeah. And it, it, I was draining, at this point, my parents uh, 
line of credit that they had against their house. Oh, wow. Which is okay. insane. I, I look back at my parents and I'm like, I'm not doing that for my boys. <laughs> <laughs> I love my boys so much, but I'm not betting the farm on, <laughs> on the, Fair on enough. Fair kids. enough. Yeah. But All they right. absolutely bet the farm on me, which is pretty wild. Yeah, sure. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So anyways, thankfully it worked out. So uh, two years after that first offer was made, I got yeah. a call out of the blue from one of those companies and they said, do you want to sell your business? It had grown by that point. Things were right. going well. Um, you know, I was getting married and, you know, drawing a salary out of the business and it was, you know, making more than I was, you know, it was making money. Sure. As a, as a subscription model business. Um, but, I, you know, they called me up and said, do you want to sell it? I said, no. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we had, I'd, I formed that line that I use now of, you know, I married my wife, not my business. Sure. <laughs> Fair so enough. I continued yep. the discussion anyway. And, uh, and sure enough, they came up with an offer that really worked out. So awesome. uh, it was also really helpful for me at the time, other than the money, because I think the money was primary driver of why I sold the business. But sure. I also had no idea what I would be growing into. Okay. So really only having worked for myself or with Scott, um, didn't prepare me to be a manager of anything. <laughs> no, I, I had no clue. And I still, in a way, kind of don't. But that was one of the things I thought was a good opportunity. So I worked for Trader. Uh, that was the, the company that, that bought GSNet. And they, I worked for them for two and a half years okay. through the whole dot-com bubble, which, which was insane. Sure. So that period was nuts. Um, there were lots of competitors in the space that sprung up overnight that right. had you now VC back in. Yeah, okay, fair enough. And you know, they showed up at the what year was it? I think it was the 90 was it 99 or 2000. I can't remember the years now, but uh, at that same conference that I went to, yeah, yeah, yeah. These these two companies showed up with just huge booths at these <laughs> things. Like they had bought the conference basically, which is saying something when you're, you know, got a bigger space than Caterpillar, let's say. Right. right? That's yeah, showing off construction yeah, equipment. Yeah, out of show. Like this is, it's big. That's wild. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. So these, they, they make these huge splash and they're from nothing, right? Sure. And they're just burning VC money. That's the, you know, like the sure. pets.com kind of time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I remember that. Yeah. And so one of these companies, they were actually literally giving away their product. But, okay. Uh, and flying people, like flying the, because there tend to be like, family-owned businesses, okay. these construction equipment dealers, they would fly the owners to San Francisco to come and visit their office to give away their product. That was what was going wow. on. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, it was completely crazy, like spending a lot of money to, to give something away. Um, and that company ended up, and I've told you this story mm -hmm. before, <laughs> Yeah, they ended no. up giving me an offer of... It, to, to come and work for them. It wasn't even to buy GSNet. They just wanted me because they needed a product person. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny now that I say that. Just like, yeah, they really needed a product person. That's hilarious. Um, they, so anyways, they, yeah, they needed a product person and they made me a, an offer, which they started off with, with options they're like okay we can, you can have options in this business and here's the opportunity with this thing we think the options will be worth like 20 million dollars and we'll fly you down to san francisco one every three weeks and you can still live in edmonton but you know sure you know we'll pay a nice like hundred fifty thousand dollars salary all this stuff i was like wow that's a pretty good deal but with my best poker face ever i was like yeah options are great but i'd like cash <laughs> So I negotiated for a $2 million cash signing bonus to come and work for these people. That's amazing. Well, yeah, it was kind of amazing, but it was also crazy, right? Like the, sure. this business was clearly nonsense and okay. was going to just go right into the ground. And so, um, yeah. And, and then I had my own craziness working for Trader. Like that was, that had funny stories too. Like, yeah. The, the interview will get too long if I tell those too. <laughs> but, uh, but it was fine. Like I, I learned a lot there too. But nevertheless, I had this dilemma. Okay, sure. Because uh, I had a non-compete, which I figured I could probably buy out if I just was to make an offer to traders. So, hey, listen, guys, uh, sure. can I buy out this non-compete for whatever whatever yeah. dollars they cared about? Um, and um, I figured they'd probably say yes. <laughs> sure, okay. <laughs> but nevertheless, I, I decided not to do that just because the company was so crazy. I thought, I'm 27, I guess it was at that point. Sure. And if I'm getting an offer like this at this point in my life, 
it might not happen again, but it could happen again. And what what is this going to mean for my career path afterwards? Like, what does it mean for my credibility going forward? Sure. Um, and so, so I chose not to pursue that. Okay, interesting. And you, I, I told, okay, I have to say, because Kevin and I have known each other for a long time. I told Kevin this story. I told you this story in I Vegas, yep. I think, before yep. I was going to tell this on stage. And you were the first person to call me out on that. Because Kevin and Lee, we're having breakfast. I tell this story. I'm like, yeah, I turned it down. And then he said, but what if it was 50? <laughs> <laughs> Best I remember that question. Yeah. Patty was there, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was so funny. And so you were spot on. It's like, yeah, you know, if if it was full on, I can just coast the rest of my life. Yeah, I probably would have taken it too. Sure. I, like that's that's the story for I'm sure you know broadcast.com. And, yeah, of you know course. some of these ones where it was just a goofy offer at the ultimately. Like, of course you're going to sell it. Yeah, <laughs> why, exactly. why would you not yeah, sell yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's a crazy amount of money to somebody else. Uh, it's not actually the person's fault for selling it. Like, sure. No, to I... be the sellout. Like, yeah, I'd want to be Mark Cuban. Sure. Yeah. It's a good, pretty good spot to be in. Lisa's bank account. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, so anyways, that was that story. Uh, then eventually it was time to, to like, you know, the dot-com bubble was crashing. The things were... It was time to rationalize. Trader uh, had actually, oh, I didn't tell that part of the story, but anyways, Trader, it was time to rationalize things at Trader, okay. and, um, which meant layoffs. Sure. Okay. And so I laid myself off, which was nice. Okay. I chose to give myself some separance. I'm like, hey guys, here's all these people to lay off. I'm one of them. Uh, I'm out. Okay. So, then, uh, so then I took some time, uh, which quickly filled up, by the way, if you ever have that opportunity where you think you've got some time and you're young. <laughs> Take it. You, you take it, but your time fills up super fast with just stuff. Sure. So, anyways, I uh, I took some time to decide what's what to do next. And one of the things we did at, at GSNet was create an email newsletter. Okay. Uh, which back in '99, it was amazing how well an email newsletter worked. Like sure. It was. It was. Well, it gold. still works. Really it still well, works. To be 100% well. honest with you. Yeah, yeah, it still works really well. It's a great. It's a great tool. So uh, there weren't real. There, there wasn't a whole lot of software. It was back when everything was either free or a hundred thousand dollars. And sure. so the, the price point for a hundred thousand dollars for the, the email newsletter software was goofy. Sure. So we wrote our own tools to, right. to do it back then. And, uh, it, so I thought, well, that's actually a really good opportunity. So that was the next business to do. Cause the thing that I liked about email was the viral component of it. This is sort of natural viral loop where, it was reasonable for us to put the name of, of, of the company at the bottom of the email because yeah. for a bunch of reasons. Um, but at the same time, that ended up being great for us as a provider that people would say, wow, how did this you know, educational consortium come up with such a great newsletter? Sure, sure. Because uh, like, it, it was sort of surprising back then to get something that looked good in your inbox. Yeah. Um, and so when people would say, how did they do that? They'd scroll to the bottom, they'd see our name, and they're like, oh, that's how they did that. Sure. And so that was literally how that business grew. And so so you can trace the roots of that business like back to some of those early things. Sure. Uh, the early customers. Yeah. Um, so so anyways, that that notion really worked. Um, and so that that business though, unfortunately the mistake that I made, uh, or thing I could have done better, we could have done better was we didn't measure as well as we should have okay. or could have going along. Like we weren't we weren't really good at understanding the full funnel. Okay. And especially, you know, although sort of intuitively, like before the business even started, that whole viral component made sense to me. Yeah. I, I never really measured it. Okay. And, Interesting. And the company that did was MailChimp. Right. So yeah, I started okay. I started mail out in two thousand one and start up as a couple different brands and that was I won't get into that. Sure. But um, you know my mail out was the first brand. And and MailChimp started at the same time and they were actually pretty crappy service okay. <laughs> compared to, to my mail out and to, to later on industry mail out and stuff. It was a pretty crappy tool. Um, for a long time. And they were not really on my radar for years. There were other sure. companies that were a lot better actually at doing this you know, constant contact and the um uh campaign monitor when they yeah. came out about 2004 really nice design like they were i remember that yeah you know, great usability like those guys were fantastic mailchimp really was an also ran to me okay. like it seemed 
I was never worried about them until I think it's 2009 or so. They came up with the freemium pricing. Yeah, because they figured it out. Like, yeah. oh, if we we're spending this much on advertising, and we're it costs us, you know, it, it only gets us this many customers sure. filling the top of our funnel. But every time we get a customer, they send out their list, and we get more customers. Yeah. So why don't we just kind of take a loss on on some of the smaller customers? and see if that grows the overall business. Sure. So they did an experiment with it at first in 2009 and it worked amazingly well because they were tracking it all well. Yeah, interesting. Right? That's good advice though for yeah, people listening. Totally, like they were tracking it. And and they had built up a business where it was more scalable than than industry mail out was the brand that we had that was was doing was more sort of a medium touch business that way like uh, an assisted SaaS model, basically, where basically you just could talk to us on the phone. Sure, yeah, no, <laughs> was the big difference. Yeah, yeah. You could literally get some really good customer support, um, but but they'd invested in that kind of business. That you could sign up online and just start working, and you get enough uh, to be able to, to do what you needed to do off the you know off the hop. Sure, and they had this great. Uh, they had that all measured out, so they could see that that worked. They were, as far as I know, they weren't the first business to try freemium, but as far as I know, and as far as I'm concerned, they, they were the first people to really master that. Yeah, they were model. very early on. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And they, they crushed it. They did really, really well. And so for what that meant for mail-out was we were still grew in our customer base, but, um, but the pricing just got sure, really yeah. squeezed, right? As, this, as MailChimp be, went from you know another company just a random company that we weren't really thinking about to now, now it's the 800 pound gorilla in that sure. space. Like they, they're, they own email now for sure. Uh, which, you know, kudos to them. Great job. So anyway, that business, uh, did well and, uh, we did mail out for 15 years. Yeah. Well, that's how you and I met. Yeah. So I think you... I met John before you. Oh yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's right. And then you would, what, what year? It was about 2009 or 2010? No, it's got to be. I met John in like 2003, 2004. Oh, wow. Yeah, because at oh, a company, I, I was working at a different company. I was working yeah. at totally. And then we started using you guys. And then just, I think every company after that, <laughs> until I started working for you, we were just using it. That's right. Well, but That's right. the people listening in America, like you guys were the Canadian partner to use to send email newsletters right like you had all the government like legislation yeah, it, plus all the government it was agencies, pretty reason, right? regional I'll, I'll, I'll give props to my friend chris carter in they they were thin thin data in ontario or thin data depending on what part sure. of the country you're yeah. from but uh they they had the, the big accounts in the country so like the big uh, you know, Aero plan accounts and stuff like that, sure. but for yeah, for small businesses and government kind of things, we and universities, we kind of, universities, yeah. Um, yeah, we actually did really well. Banks, universities, and governments. So we we had most of those markets. Sure, it was awesome. So walk me through the rest of the mail out journey until selling it because you sold it after a decade and a half. It's yeah, most. It's funny, like when people considered you as a startup, you're like, we've been around 10 years and we've yeah. been making money for a long time. It's like, okay, yeah. where, where's that cutoff, right? Yeah. Yeah. The terminology is always funny, right? Um, but we, yeah, so we, we, we started, it was pretty humble at the start. Um, it was similar to the previous business. It cost money as a SaaS business or, sure. or as a, particularly the um, recurring revenue model, like a yeah. subscription model, which I love subscription model, but sure. you've got to be ready to starve for a couple of years if you're bootstrapping uh, a SaaS business, like Fair that's enough. just how it goes. And so, so that's how it was. I think we, it was a year and a half before there was enough money coming in that I could start to pay myself a salary. Okay. Uh, and when I say a salary, I think it was five hundred bucks <laughs> a month for a gotcha. little bit. Like, sure. But there, you know, that was it, it was counts. a year and a half to 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 sort of break even yeah. cash flow wise. Um, and but then the the great part of that was that the you know the the metrics of it are that the the customers that don't leave each month they just keep yeah you know, keep paying and so. Are it's really hard to measure those things early on in the business. Like it's pretty wonky numbers, to be honest. If you don't have a lot of volume, like if, sure. But um, nevertheless, by the by the time we were sold, that we we had 
our churn rate was less than one percent a month. Wow. Which meant that our that's our, huge actually, or well, really right, good. Yeah, yeah it's really yeah. good. So, and and comparatively, the the company that bought us, they bought a lot of other businesses. Uh, in, they were sort of consolidator in the space, and they were kind of taken aback by that part. Like, so we got sure. a, a good you know we got a good price for the business yeah. because is that, that why you sold then ultimately or were you kind yeah. of getting sick of being in the space or yeah well so it it, it was going well uh i'll back up a little bit more i'll tell a little bit more story so you know we, we it, it went well in the beginning uh it was sort of our, our mantra for the first couple of years was just don't screw up <laughs> Because <laughs> we didn't really know how to grow it better in sure. terms of like we weren't really smart on the on the, you know top, the measuring the funnel all that kind of stuff. But what we did see was that it was growing. Sure. And if we just did a good job for customers, that's how well, we customer tended to service spread. was the big thing. Customer right? service was a big thing, and and following through on what we said we would sure. deliver. You know, we did that every time. And so well, and that phone was support too, right? Like that you're one of the yeah. few companies that did actual true phone support. Like you could call that number in. Yeah. I was really adamant that, that we didn't have uh, you know, push this to get so and so kind of thing. When when people would call, they would get somebody on the phone yep. immediately yep. who could answer their question ninety nine percent of the time. And yep. fix their problem, which was that that actually yeah, that was one of the funny stories. We had those those different verticals that we dealt with. Yeah. One of them, um, one of them was was mostly just for fun, uh, but it was for with with starving artists. Okay, right. Sure. So remember Groupie Corral yep. as a yeah. brand. So we had that brand, Groupie Corral, which was great. I had some you know great experiences meeting different musicians and stuff from that, which was really cool. Sure. But musicians were a terrible customer base, and so I had this this customer who was. I had one hour phone call of customer support with this guy <laughs> who was paying $54 a year and could not complain enough about our service that was $54 a year. And then the literally the next phone call was this uh, it, like this mutual fund company who was okay. paying $50,000 a year sure. for kind of a similar service. Like it was a very it was like nominal, like were differences, but it was pretty nominal. Sure. And it was a quick phone call. He had a change to the things to, to what the email should look like. I was like, did, 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 did it. And, you know, hit refresh on your screen and it was already done. He said, and the guy said, you know what? You guys are the best customer service of any software we have here at sure. this company. Very cool, though. Yeah, it was a really great compliment. But I thought, uh, it's time to stop doing Groupie Corral. <laughs> <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. This is not, not a good use of our time. So we did that. Um, Anyway, so getting back to, to like selling mail out, um, it was kind of interesting. Like we started another business and that was uh, you that you worked on as well, yeah. which was Inked yeah. It, which is a really fun project or like a super interesting one and one I'd love, love to return to one day. Sure. Um, I think but, it was ahead of its time. But. Yeah, it was. Uh, which that's a euphemism for, yeah, we failed. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, sure. Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> right? It didn't work out. So that was the first business that, that I tried that didn't work out. Sure, um, but it was pretty bold vision as well. Um, but the the one of the things that that I set for myself, especially as a bootstrap business, is to to be working myself out of a job essentially. So okay. as a small business, I'd I'd observe lots of other small businesses that owners um, would, you know, I'd have this respect for people that they would that would work so hard that what they're doing or so on. But if you don't actually delegate and give people responsibility and and kind of ownership of what they're doing at work, then sure. you become this vital component to the business that cannot be removed or everything falls apart. Yeah, interesting. And so so that was a really important thing for for me to be able to to, to do. So it wasn't so 2001 mail out started. It was 2009 that I had my first long vacation right you know i went with my family to europe for three weeks came back cool. and i had nothing to do when i got back there was nothing but isn't that a scary feeling as the I owner almost, and ceo I, I was tearing up in the office <laughs> i was so happy <laughs> but most people wouldn't be happy right oh, they would be freaked out maybe but i was overjoyed i was like this uh, this this means i'm free yeah fair <laughs> I, I realized the vision of I'm not necessary here, which, which meant so many things, right? Sure. It meant that, that that was a business that ultimately could be sold if, if somebody had an offer for it. Like it was a saleable thing because 
I didn't need to be part of it. Yeah, interesting. I, right. Yeah, I guess. Hey, most people probably don't think of it like that. Yeah. Right? When you when you have a bootstrap business, you have to think of it that way. Sure. Otherwise, you are you're just you know creating a business to try and make a salary for yourself. That's a terrible idea. Because yeah, this advice. is way too hard. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> this is really hard. You need a return on your investment. Like that that ROI thing sure. is, it, there's a reason that exists. So you need to actually you know, think of it that way, that investment of a couple of years of not making money and putting money into it, we needed to make a return on that. And thankfully, you know, it was a good return on that. Sure. Um, and we made money, I made a salary along the way and was able to, to spin out cash, which then we spent a lot of the... Uh, proceeds of the business on the other interesting project called inked it yeah sure uh which unfortunately didn't work out but uh that one we i that was a great learning experience that one i kind of tried to uh, i i made a mistake in that with inked it of not getting investment early okay getting other people involved early because it it w was going to require a lot of money Sure. To get so, it off what the was Inkit? Maybe just give a quick overview of what exactly. So, we Inkit, the idea there was that we were trying to. Uh, uh, there were a couple things that were sort of origin stories of it. I I hate paper, like carrying little bits of sure. paper around um, from receipts. And back then, uh, and I think still in the states, people have to sign. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes yeah. on yeah. Uh, credit card receipts, so you'd like write your name on these. It's meaningless that you write your name on these things, and I had to carry them all around for the government. I hated that. Um, I also had a, a funny experience with uh, telco. Everybody always has, you know, utility companies and stuff has the, the terrible stories of customer service that. Yeah. I had one of those <laughs> where the, the telco, it was clear to me after I was arguing with them for a long time that, that I had the contract in front of me. And the, the people who were trying to do this, collect $2,000 from us, didn't have the contract in front of them. Okay. And... I thought that was crazy. Like, how does this company... Like, they lost it, basically. They lost it. And I, and I remember the sales guy who had sold our company on this, on this sure. utility. I'm sure it's still, like, in the backseat of his car. <laughs> like, he was pretty... He didn't seem like he was going to last too long at that company. That's but, hilarious. Um, so, so that was an interesting thing. Like, just realizing a big... Organ I thought, as a big company like that, yeah managing all these bits of paper would be super hard sure um then also we had companies uh, customers that their names of the company would change over time so we did have some contracts with sure. with customers for mail out where um you know the name would change from beginning with an a to beginning with an i and then as a uh, somebody new would come into the company um if you didn't know the history, you wouldn't know where in the filing cabinet the contract is. Sure. Or just a simple thing like that. Like, so then you have to come up with some convoluted contract number thing and so on. So there's like things, it's a challenge to that. But the contract itself would all have old information written into it. Um, and so these are the things that, it, and then also like negotiating or even, even setting up our unanimous shareholders agreement, which by the way, everybody should have for their their businesses sure so with my partners with mail out we set up our unanimous shareholders agreement even though we didn't argue at all in that process it took months yeah, just like bouncing around between the various you know accountants and the lawyer and the insurance company and it just it took way too long to just get the thing done sure and signed by everybody so all of that together made me think there's got to be a better way we've got we're using we're not using technology here. Like we're, what we were doing with electronic signatures and, and documents was to try and take a piece of paper and replicate it on a computer screen, yeah. which is a weird idea, really. Like what we, what it will eventually move to is sure. an electronic document. Sure. That is well, legible it, and readable yeah. and, and machine readable yeah. and all of these smart things. That's going to happen eventually. And it should be, you know, you should be able to read it on your mobile device. You should be able to read it on your desktop. You should be able to nowadays have, you know, if you want uh, Alexa or yeah, Siri to read no, it totally. to you, you, that should be possible, right? Yep. Um, but that certainly was, isn't going to be the case with some of the current tools that are in that space. No, fair enough. Um, anyway, so th that seems super interesting to me as well as the, the, the social graph that, that Facebook was talking about and has created this connection between individuals, the friendships, uh, you know, that you and I are friends on Facebook. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and what that 
does in terms of just organizing ourselves and being able to, to um, I don't know, just see these these connections between things. So, you know, when when I don't know if you move or something like that, we'll still be Facebook friends, yeah, yeah. right? We'll yeah. still have that connection. So all of the other uh, things that, like your phone numbers and your stuff that that changes all the time. Um, that doesn't change the the relationship. It doesn't get lost if you sure. just move, which is used yeah. to be the old problem, right? Like yeah. when back in the old days for, you know, people who are pre Facebook <laughs> <laughs> listeners, then back in the old days, your address book was constantly out of date. Yeah. Like someone would yeah. just move down the yeah. street basically. And you, you're not friends anymore because yeah. you can't get a hold of them. Right. No, fair <laughs> it enough. It would be yeah. really annoying. So, um, so anyways, that, like that's, that was a really interesting thing to, to tie. We were tying all that together basically with sure. it. And, um, the idea was to be able to, uh, sign a document and do that electronically, but the handwritten signature was kind of irrelevant. It was just more about like the, the connection of you, your identity to the actual agreement that was being made. And then organically over time after that, that, that all of the parties to that would be able to, you know, keep track of that legal relationship. And that all the, the things that happen in that uh, transaction could also be automatically triggered, sure. right? Which, you know, since then, like Ethereum and some of these other cool yeah. things, uh, you know, have sprung up that would, would uh, do a better job. It would be a better, better tool for solving that problem than what we were using back then. But Interesting. Anyway. Yeah. So... Walk me through what you're doing now. You sell Mello, you shut down Inkdit. What are you doing now? So, um, so it was actually after uh, after we sold Mail Out. Yeah, there was a it wasn't a buy, uh, like an earn out period, but there was a period of time where we were sort of working for the company that that had bought it. So I had very little to do, and Inkdit we had actually literally just put it on the back burner. So, okay. so that. That wasn't, it was clear it wasn't going to work out. We didn't just shut it right down. We had okay. customers. Sure. And it actually just kept running for years. And the funny, I don't think I've ever told you this, but but from the time that, that you left and like we kind of wound it down and sure. we put it on the back burner. Yeah. About a year after that, it started to grow. Okay. Which was, we had no idea why. Like, okay. We, we were spending zero dollars on it and sure. it started to grow. And like doubling kind of growth. Oh, like, wow. It was, it was really growing. And so that seemed pretty interesting. Sure. But... Uh, so I thought, okay, it's time to take another run at this maybe. Okay. So I, was, I started poking around at, and trying to raise some money for that. Yeah. Um, and in the midst of that, I ran into the now co-founder of Zept, the okay. new business that we're working on now, our new startup. And I ran into him at a coffee shop here in Edmonton and had a, you know, the conversation that the people have of, you know, what do you do for a living? Because I, I sort of knew him. I knew him through, okay. through his wife, actually. I've okay. been a, served on boards and stuff like that with his wife. And I said, you know, so Tony, what do you, what do, you do for a living? And his line that day was hilarious. He said, you know, what I do is stupid. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, tell me more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> super interesting. Up. Like, yeah, you yeah. got me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he said, he said, you know, I'm a consultant to universities for international student recruitment. Okay. And he went on to describe the marketplace for international students and for universities trying to recruit them and how how sort of dysfunctional it is like there's this 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 crazy this crazy problem to solve and you know you said that that universities today will still like they'll fly people over to pitch their university to a group of high school students in the middle of you know whatever country like just pick a country it doesn't matter but like just standing in a pitching a, a, your university to a bunch of high school students that, that's a pretty low yield way to operate right yeah interesting um, yeah. but that's kind of the, the that was the challenge for for the universities and you know as, as you described that I was like oh that's kind of interesting like everybody's heard of the same you know five universities like everyone sure. knows Harvard right everyone yeah, knows yeah. MIT and Stanford and Stanford right <laughs> and, and sure. Oxford yeah. and Cambridge yeah. and and then after that, it starts to taper off, right? Like sure. there's you know, okay, Yale and Princeton or whatever. And I thought, you know, I've never heard of, at this point, I'd never heard of any school in Australia. Okay, sure. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I couldn't tell you any school in Ireland, even though I have a cousin that went to one. That's hilarious. <laughs> right? Okay. Like sure. I couldn't name any of these other places. And yet they're actually good schools. And I thought, oh, the same is true for Canada. You know, we have 
as a local market, you always know your own universities and schools and things. Yeah, what's there. good and bad. What's yeah. good and bad, or what is, or, or kind of what's worth applying to. So, yeah, you okay. know, go back to my story. I, I came out of high school. I knew my grades were such that I would be able to go to university at the university in town here, which, like I say, happened to be a good university. Sure. But, um, but I would not be able to say even you know, a couple provinces over, like I wouldn't be able to say in Manitoba what were, yeah. was it a good school or not? Or which ones, University yeah. of Winnipeg or University of Manitoba? I don't know. Are they the same? Are they different? Yeah. I, so, yeah. Okay. Fair and enough. so I, I, you know, you multiply that problem by, uh, by 4,000 schools sure. that are and available. And you put an ocean in between. Put an ocean in between. <laughs> it's like, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of people actually go to the, to the schools that we know the names of. For sure. And everybody else has to find a school. For sure. <laughs> and finding a school is a crazy problem because they also have to choose you. Yeah. So, so that, that just kind of set my mind spinning because uh, my other business partner, John, had got me on to, to Ben Thompson's podcast. Who's a, you got to sure. get him on the show. Yeah. yeah. yeah we're, working awesome. on, yeah. we're working on that. Yeah. we work on that one. He'd be great. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah. The, he, this, his aggregation theory was was very much in my head at okay. that moment, and so it's this idea of aggregating, uh, like what the internet fundamentally does is be is give you the opportunity in these marketplaces to aggregate supply and demand sure. through one source, right? So and in particular, the supply side, and so the other thing that Tony described to me in that coffee shop was that there's there about a third of the market of, of international students will go through what's called an education agent to f help find them a school. Sure. And the way that the education agent works, it is the classic agency problem where an agent doesn't get paid. They, they get paid by the schools on the other side, but they only get paid by a, a school that they have a contract with already. Right. So it's like, oh, that's, that's a, like you know, that's a problem. And sure. I, you know, intellectually, I thought, okay, that's the classic agency problem. Yep. And it turns out, it is pretty bad. Like there, there are a lot of really bad stories. Of, sure. You know, it's an unregulated market because it's all across jurisdictions. It's basically impossible to. Regulate. Yeah, you can't force other countries' law in another country. Yeah. yeah, yeah like, like super, super yeah. hard, uh, unsolvable problem. And and so it, it ends up being just a mess. Um, sure. So there are obviously there are good people working in that space. There are people that are agents that are education agents that try and do their best for people. But even those uh, people who are trying to do their best to help the their customers, the students, uh, they still are in that same boat. If they don't get paid unless they put a student in a school that they have a contract with. Yeah. So it might be only like five or ten or whatever yeah. the, the so number is. If you've got four thousand schools to choose from, but your middleman. Is yeah. actually only choosing from ten. Yeah. Are you really getting in the best school for you? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. So that was that kind of was fascinating. And then the last thing that he that he told me at that space was just the size of the marketplace. And uh, I actually thought he exaggerated. I thought he added a zero. So he said, you know, just in Canada alone, that there was six billion dollars of tuition paid by international students. Wow. That's with a B. With a B. Yeah, with a B. <laughs> And I thought, okay, you've added a zero. It's actually sure. 600 million, but that's... Which is still awesome. Which <laughs> I is still was shocked about because he had also said these education agents make 10 to 30% of the commission on the first year tuition. Sure. So, uh, you know, you do the math. I'm like, oh, this is, that's a huge market. Yeah. Well, so he turned out to be wrong. It was true. Okay. He was wrong, but he was actually under saying it. So wow. it was, that year it was $8 billion of wow. tuition paid by international students. And so now it's going to be more like 10 okay. uh, or Very maybe cool. more actually this year. And globally, it's over $100 billion of tuition paid by international students. So students wow. going from one country to another to, to, to take education, sure, higher education. So that's kind of an amazing marketplace. And so these are the, you know, over the checklists of startup stuff. Yeah. Like, it, it's kind of funny, actually, that, you know, that VCs, they always hear the same pitches for more or less. It's like, sure. just it's swap out the name or whatever. But we, we hit all of these things. It's like, oh, $100 billion market. That, yep. Check. Yeah. <laughs> right? Fair. So there's a marketplace of $100 billion. Uh, there's, there, you know, there's, there's this opportunity for disruption here, which hasn't happened in this space, right? Sure. So it's like a traditional way of, of doing things. Um, and so there, there's no aggregator yet that's, that's really hit stride. And so, you know, opportunity there, check. Yeah. Um, 
No. So anyways, that this is when Zept was born. So from that conversation, I ended up kind of dropping Inked it thinking, okay, that's, I know that's a really hard project and it's really hard to resuscitate something. Sure. Uh, but then in something we started, started Zept and, uh, yeah, this has been the ride since. And yeah. we, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so you've been doing Zept a year and a half, two years now ish. Yeah. So, uh, launched, we, we ended up launching the, the first product or like the, the service to the world in December of 2017. Like, so okay. it was just to students at that point. Sure. And, uh, w- what we ended up coming up with is basically like a dating app. Sure. So, you know, applying some of these things for aggregation theory. So we, we, we say, okay, we can, we're going to, we're going to be the one to recommend schools to students. Cause the thing that a student has is sort of tyranny of choice. Um, and so a student just puts in their grades, what they want to study. And the idea is we recommend schools one at a time, like kind of like Tinder. Sure. Right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes certain people laugh and certain people scratch their heads. But, um, <laughs> so the, yeah, so it's basically like a dating app though, to, to find a school. We show schools one at a time. And, and the idea is not showing a list of things that you've never heard of, like, but to actually just really get a good look at each school. Sure. Are you interested or are you not kind of thing? And yeah. so if you're not interested, you know, show us the next school. And if you are interested, then what we do and what we've, the way we built our, our business model around is you favorite that school, uh, kind of swipe right ish. Sure. And then the, when you favorite that school, we tell the recruiters from that school. So not an agent in the middle, but the recruiter, the, the actual school itself that, Hey, this kid with these grades from this high school, in this country is interested in studying philosophy at your sure. university do you want to talk to her sure and so it's actually going back to the mailchimp thing what yeah. i learned from that freemium yeah. model yeah it's a freemium model for the school it's like here's somebody that's actually interested and we're trying to create a little bit of fear of missing out actually from these sure. schools uh you know here's a kid that we've qualified to this point and they're interested in your program and you know if, if it's philosophy as an example oftentimes schools have tenured profs and empty seats. And so they, they need to hustle a little bit to actually get students for particular programs instead sure. of just, you know, sitting back and waiting for, for people to come. And so that's a, an opportunity for them to do that. And, and interestingly, the pricing model ends up being more or less the same as the agents. Cause that's what, what schools understand. Already. And they expect. So we, yeah, we just went with the path of least resistance when we asked schools, like, you know, what's your price? How, what, how should we charge you for this basically? Sure. And they said, well, this we can't afford to to pay per lead but we could pay on success yeah well i think that's great and and it's interesting because you and i have kept in touch throughout the years that we between working together yeah and like we go for lunch what maybe once twice a year maybe ish yeah something like that we exchange some emails and we got chatting and you were looking and i thought i ended up kind of having a company that got bought and i was looking for something new and we got chatting and so I started with you guys a, couple, like a month or so ago now, and we've yeah. been kind of working on Zep together. So I That's thought we, we should at least have you on the show to kind of talk about that. Yeah. Right? So where do you see Zep kind of going? And because there's a huge, huge, obviously global market for this, but yeah. that's got to be a bit daunting as well to kind of even wrap your head around. It's daunting, but it's also what's kind of cool and fun about it. Sure. So you know, being a global market and a lot of, you know, it's a big space, there's lots of people in it and lots of moving parts that actually really feeds into to machine learning yeah and we sit here in edmonton in canada in a market that has a lot of talent around ai sure uh which i you know i shouldn't be promoting so much oh i shouldn't no, shouldn't yeah, i guess yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll promote yeah. the you know the university of alberta and the the the, the, the talent that's coming out of that space of that university uh but uh, but fortunately, the world hasn't woken up to it so much. So we're able to, to work with some amazing people like Sergey. Yeah, so yeah, sure. Uh, which is fantastic. So uh, so that ends up being a really good opportunity for us. Like right now, we've started off just because of the throughput and that that's required to make a system like this work. We just started with one market being yeah. Canada right. to start off. And it's logical. We you know go where we know. Um, but But we're expanding to the rest of the world. Uh, over the next few few months, basically. Sure. So when it, the, our our mission, which is is cool too, so our mission is about you know, helping students get into the best school possible. Sure. Yeah, you know, we can't do that unless we're actually giving them the choice of everything. Yeah. Right? So so where we want we want all options to be 
uh, in the algorithm of what's going to be um, recommended next. And and yeah, so that's that's our next steps is to sort of expand it to the rest of the world and make sh- and keep growing the AI side of it. Um, getting the training data in terms of the AI side. Yeah, of, interesting. Of getting better and better data of you know whether whether you're you'll complete this program if you start it sure. is a really interesting thing for us. So that's yeah. a project that we're that we're working on. So anybody who has that kind of data, if you're at a university, <laughs> we'd love to talk to you. Uh, yeah, because training data is really important for the sure. AI. So, yeah. No, that's very cool. Yeah, because I think that's the one thing that excited me about um, what you guys were doing at Zep to come back and, and work yeah. with you guys again. Because the crazy thing is like the team is literally like half the people I worked with a number yeah. of years ago are like still working yeah. together, which is cool, right? You it is really fun. Like, it, it, well, it's fun, but it's also, you know, that's a, it's a compliment, I think. Totally I'll, it is. You know, pat my own back. Or, or, I mean, collectively, so it's a team. Like there's myself and Mike and John who work together now for, you know, well, more than 15 years sure uh, mike and i for 20 years but um yeah it's really great to be able to work with people that you've worked with before and and there was a time actually where you know i i would have sort of thought whenever we uh, lose somebody i would say sure. <laughs> you know, yeah you okay. lose an employee at a company it's it, it's kind of a kick in the gut in a way it's like oh but i i actually really came to the realization that um it's great to be a springboard for people in their career right Interesting. and so i know that uh you know some of the other people that we've worked with yeah over the years they've had really they've, they've gone on to some really cool stuff they've also well. come back too and we've had a come, few people come back if you come back yourself included yeah. like i i think uh, maybe well maybe coming back means <laughs> <laughs> is this a downgrade <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no but it's, i think it's really great actually to to be to, to be able to create a company that that also promotes the growth sure. of people right and and i hold that pretty loosely now i didn't have for a long time of saying you know it's a really good thing if our organization helps is part of somebody's personal growth sure. and their career path and so we some people will stay for ever and that's great and some people will you know will be a springboard to the next thing and then maybe they'll come back again sure, <laughs> like yeah, you. you never know right but, yeah. or maybe not and yeah. even if it's not the fact that that somebody by working with this group of people furthers their own career uh that helps us hire the next person too sure well and they may recommend somebody too because totally. there's been times where yeah. like i've run into past employees we've met up at your office right, right? Before, yeah. when i didn't work there and yeah. like it, it's interesting right that you the burning kind of bridges type thing from the yeah. employer or the employee side has always been kind of yeah. an interesting thing. So Greg, you bootstrapped your first couple companies, but you're looking to raise money for Zep. What made you to actually decide to raise money for Zep instead of bootstrap? With Zep, it's a big opportunity. It's a bigger space and the mar- it's a marketplace business. So that means that uh, it's a winner take most scenario. And so in this this day and age, uh, it takes a lot of money to, to win a market. And so that's why we chose to, to raise money. And so uh, in going through the Creative Destruction Lab, uh, that was a really great thing for us in helping us raise money. And so that's actually connected us to, to some to VCs and so on. Uh, but fundraising is not that fun. <laughs> but it's gone pretty well so far. Uh, it's still in the midst of a round, though. But Greg, we're out of time. So Let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about Zept and yourself, if you want to mention Oh, for sure. Else. Thank you. Yeah, so zept.co is the website. So it's a web app, and of course, it's on the iOS and uh, App Store, Zept. Perfect. Greg, well, I really appreciate you taking the time of your day to be on the show, and I, well, we'll keep in touch because we work together every day. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> thanks again, and we'll talk soon. Thank All you. Right. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. And keep building the future.